Hello. As you may know, I am a mother. And so today I'd like to discuss the historic origins of nursery rhymes. Now, all of these are presumptions that have been made because a lot of these nursery rhymes were recited for decades, if not centuries, before they were written down. But let's explore these nursery rhymes. So welcome to the historic origins of some favorite nursery rhymes. Again, these are all presumptions made by historians and research that I've done because, again, these were recited for years and years before they were written down. And so that with some of the nursery rhymes, there are conflicting stories as to the origin or why they were written the way they were. And just in case you're curious, on the bottom left-hand side of the screen is a picture from Mother Goose's Melody from the late 1700s. First, why did nursery rhymes become a thing? Nursery rhymes are part of a long-standing tradition of parody and a popular political resistance to high culture and royalty. In a time when you could um, caricature royalty or politicians when that was punishable by death, nursery rhymes proved a potent way to smuggle in coded or thinly veiled messages in the guise of children's entertainment. In largely illiterate societies, the catchy sing-song melodies helped people remember the stories and crucially pass them on to the next generation. In today's world, many people may sing these rhymes without knowing the possible hidden meanings behind the words that they recite. The Victorians created the British Society for Nursery Rhyme Reform and went through great lengths to clean up many of these rhymes. By 1941, this society had condemned at least 100 nursery rhymes for suggesting unsavory elements such as poverty, death, scorning religion. One, one in particular mentioned prostitutes. It just unsavory elements. So many nursery rhymes um, were dark in their origin. This isn't too surprising when you think of all of the folk tales that the Brothers Grimm had collected over the years. Just remember Cinderella and the cutting off of the heel. Not exactly cheery. So first we have Little Bo Peep. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home and bring their tails behind them. This rhyme is suggested to date back to the 16th century in England. There is a reference to Bo Peep in Shakespeare's King Lear. It's in Act 1, Scene 4. And Bo Peep is in reference to a peekaboo game. So for example, if you took a handkerchief and put it over a baby's eyes and go, Bo Peep. And so with the peep, you would remove the handkerchief so Bo is hiding the baby's eyes and then Peep is removing the handkerchief. The earliest printed version of this nursery rhyme, however, did not appear until 1805 in a manuscript and it was later published in 1810 in Gammer Girton's Garland. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. This, I think, is a fun one, Jack and Jill. We all know this rhyme. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. The first references I could find on Jack and Jill are actually in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream and also in his Love's Labor Lost. Jack refers to a male and Jill was a stereotype for a female. There was also a 16th century English proverb that said, a good Jack makes a good Jill. The, um, these ideas reinforce the names that were used for stereotypes for males and females. So with Jack and Jill, think of it as being like John Doe and Jane Doe 
in modern times. One popular theory with the Jack and Jill rhyme is that it's based on France's King Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Marie Antoinette, who were both found guilty of treason and later beheaded. So Jack fell down. That would be Louis the Sixteenth lost his crown, and then Jill came tumbling after him. Then that would be Marie Antoinette losing her head. The only thing that's a problem with this theory is that Louis the Sixteenth was not beheaded until 1793, and the earliest known recording of this rhyme is from 1765. And with that, it was actually written as Jack and Jill, Jill being spelled like Gill with a G. Uh, Jill, spelled with a G, so it looks like Gill, was introduced as a unit of volume for measuring liquids, specifically wine and whiskey, in the 14th century. Uh, Jill is four US fluid ounces or five British fluid ounces, which equals one quarter of pint. A jack, which is also known as a jackpot or a double jigger, was half the size of a jill, so one eighth of a pint. In other words, you need two jacks to make one jill. Around 1625, Parliament refused Charles I's reform on the tax of liquid measures. He wanted to increase the taxes on the pints that were sold. So instead, he ordered that the volume of a jack, and consequently also a jill, be reduced, while keeping the tax the same amount. This is where you get the jack, the price of the jack. He put the, the amount of liquid down, but was being charged the same amount. So then if the jack went down, then how much went into a jill? also decreased while the amount of the tax stayed the same. It was still a way for him to get more money from taxes. And if you look at some pint glasses today, some still have the half pint lines with a crown above them to symbolize this during Charles the first reign. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Yes sir, yes sir, three bags full. One for my master, and one for my dame. One for the little boy who lives down the lane. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Yes sir, yes sir, three bags full. This rhyme is about the great custom. It was a tax on wool that was introduced in 1275. This tax supplied King Edward I with a steady income from the lucrative wool trade. Wool was an important export of England. So one bag for my master, that's for the king. One bag for the dame, that refers to the church. So that's two thirds of your money already gone. One to the king, one to the church, which only leaves the farmers one third of their earnings that was left. And some early recordings of this rhyme actually have the line, the last line saying, but none for the little boy who cries in the lane. And then on here, I've also got a picture of the, the sheep from Mother Goose's Melody that was first published in 1765. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. This rhyme is about Richard Cromwell. He was the son of believe the third son of Oliver Cromwell. He succeeded his father as Lord Protector upon his father's death in September 1658. Richard, he had no interest in this position. He was described as being timid like a mouse, as we see in this rhyme. He only held the position as Lord Protector for nine months. By May 1659, he had already submitted his resignation. And during his lifetime, he earned unfavorable nicknames such as Tumble Down Dick or Hickory Dick. Dick is a nickname for the name Richard. And I believe after he stepped down as Lord Protector, he moved to France for, I think it was, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was 20 years before he moved back to England. 
and the king allowed him to move back, did not see him at all as a threat because, again, he was timid like a mouse. Here's another one. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and maids all in a row. This rhyme refers to Mary I of England. She was also known as Bloody Mary. She was the elder daughter of Henry VIII. Henry VIII reigned from, I believe it was 1509 until, I want to say 1548, and then his son, Edward VI, took over in 1548 and reigned until 1553. And both Henry VIII, he started the church reform and moved from the Catholic Church to the Protestant Church, created the Church of England and became head of the church. Edward VI followed in his father's footsteps and was even more adamant as far as being Protestant. Mary, however, had been raised in the Catholic Church with her mother, who was the first queen of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. So Mary was very Catholic. So when she stepped up to the throne in 1553, when Edward VI died without an heir, Mary wanted to move Catholic back to being, or move England back to being completely Catholic. She wanted to get rid of the Protestant religion and restore England to the one true faith. And Mary was Queen of England from 1553 until 1558. And I believe she had don't quote me on this, but I believe she put over 300 people to death for being martyrs, for being Protestant, or in one way or another, not being Catholic enough for her. So Mary was quite contrary. This is um, an allusion to the reversal of both the political and the religious changes that were brought on by Henry VIII, her father, and Edward VI, who was her younger brother. So she was contrary to them. Her garden is an allusion to graveyards. Silver bells and cockle shells are nicknames for flowers. However, these also could have been nicknames for torture devices. The silver bells were thumb screws, and the cockle shells were specifically meant for um, tor uh, as a torture device for men. And I'll leave it at that. And the pretty maids all in a row that might refer to Iron Maidens, which is a torture device. You know, you stand inside what looks like a coffin and it has a whole bunch of nails inside of it. Or it may also refer to the other ladies that were in line for the throne after her. If you do not know this part of history, after Edward VI died, Jane, um, this is where Lady Jane Grace stepped up as queen, queen for nine days because Jane was a cousin to Mary and Jane and her two younger sisters each had a claim to the throne as well as Mary having a claim to the throne as well as her sister who became Elizabeth I had a claim to the throne as well as Mary, Queen of Scots, who had a claim to this throne and all of those claims branch from Henry VII who was their, Mary's grandfather. So this pretty maids all on the road could actually refer to all of the maids because there were all these women in line for the throne, but no men. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to fetch her poor dog a bone. But when she went there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog had none. Old Mother Hubbard, this was one when doing research it actually surprised me because I've done a little bit of research about Henry VIII and I have really enjoyed studying the time period with Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and I never knew that this rhyme, Old Mother Hubbard, could have actually referred to um, Thomas Wolsey who was Cardinal and he was Lord Chancellor of England in the early 16th century. For those who do not know, Thomas Wolsey, he was, like I said, Lord Chancellor, and he was the one who Henry had sent to Europe to 
the Pope to try to negotiate his divorce and pretty much he was not able to negotiate the divorce. And so in this rhyme, you can see the bone is the divorce. The doggy is Henry VIII. And because Wolsey could not get the divorce that Henry VIII wanted from Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, so he could marry Anne Boleyn, his second wife, the cupboard in this rhyme refers to the Catholic Church. Because at this time, well, for part of this time, the Pope was actually being held captive by the King of Spain, who was nephew to Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife. So when he's being held captive, the Pope really isn't going to grant Henry VIII a divorce and anger the person who's holding him captive. Which meant Wolsey did not follow through with the divorce like Henry VIII wanted, and so Henry VIII was excommunicated from the Catholic Church and created the Church of England, became Protestant, and made himself head of the church. Old King Cole. Old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for the, his fiddlers three. This was first published in William King's work, The Useful Transactions in Philosophy, around 1708. There, when you do research on this, there are a couple of assumptions as far as which king this could refer to. Um, there's Cole the Old, who was the old King Cole. He was the king of Northern Britain during the decline of the Roman Empire. There are also assumptions that it could mean the Cole, who I believe was his son, who um, became canonized as a saint. Or in, I believe it's Gaelic, Cole actually refers to music or dance. And so this could actually just simply mean like you're calling for a dance. Hey, diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. With this, I did some research and then found myself going into a rabbit hole and then a little more into a rabbit hole. In 1569, Thomas Preston wrote a lamentable tragedy mixed full of pleasant mirth containing the life of Cambus's King of Persia. In this play, he wrote the lines, they be at hand, sir, with stick and fiddle. They can play a new dance called Hey Diddle Diddle. So Hey Diddle Diddle might be a reference to a dance. With this, Elizabeth I, if you remember from before where I discussed Mary and Edward VI and the other sister, Elizabeth I, she may have been the cat. Elizabeth was known as being the Virgin Queen. She had plenty of men who all proposed marriage to her, and she entertained these different pro proposals throughout, throughout her life. But think of a cat playing a game, like playing with a, a ball, where it might play, it might play, but it may never actually catch the toy that's trying to catch, especially like a laser pointer, if the cat's trying to catch the laser pointer, but it never quite catches that red dot. She also enjoyed dancing and especially enjoyed fiddle music. So this, the cat and the fiddle, so that might be a reference to Elizabeth and her enjoying fiddle music. As far as the little dog, it was reported that Elizabeth would refer to Robert Dudley as like her little lap dog. Robert Dudley was a childhood friend and also later became someone that she was possibly interested in romantically. But I'll get more into that in just a moment. As far as the dish running away with the spoon, Lady Catherine Gray, remember before with Bloody Mary and when I mentioned Lady Jane Gray, who became queen for nine days, Lady Catherine Gray was one of her sisters. And she secretly married Edward Seymour, first Earl of Hertford, in December of 1560. 
Lady Catherine was the taster of the royal meals, meaning the plate, and the Earl of Hertford, he was the bearer of the golden flatware into the royal dining room, represented by the spoon. So the plate, Lady Catherine ran away with the spoon, Edward Seymour. So that was in December of 1560. In regards to the, to the cat, that could also refer to a game called trap ball. But um, this rhyme was another that was published around 1760 in Mother Goose's Melody. So again, this is one that was recited over decades before actually being written down. So this is again, all assumption. And so trying to go back into history and figure out what it was referring to or who it applied to. So when you think of the cow jumping over the moon, when you hear someone say they're over the moon about something, it usually indicates that they're happy with the result. The term cow has been used as an insulting word for women for centuries. So the question that I have is, who could have the large cow be, the large woman? Because if, you, if the rest of this rhyme applies to Elizabeth, then who is the large woman? So hey diddle diddle, that's the dance. The cat and the fiddle, Elizabeth and her dancing. Uh, I'm sorry if this sounds mean. The large woman was happy about something. And then Robert Dudley laughed to see such sport and seeing Catherine run away with Edward. As far as the large woman, um, and where I said I would come back to discussing Robert Dudley, Robert Dudley had been married. His name, or his wife's name was Amy Robsart. Amy Robsart died in, I believe it was early 1560. So around that same time, Elizabeth, before Amy died, because I think that was in May 1560, but before Amy died, Elizabeth had received a proposal for marriage from the King of Sweden. And he actually sent his brother as a groom in proxy with this proposal. And Elizabeth politely declined, but I'm wondering with like the proposal coming in early 1560 and with Catherine running away with Edward Seymour, was Amy Robsart maybe the large woman who was happy like that Elizabeth was getting this proposal from the King of Sweden and so then was not entertaining romantic thoughts with Amy Robsart's husband who was Robert Dudley because when Amy Robsart died, she's the one who either fell down the stairs or was pushed down the stairs. Somehow her body was found dead at the bottom of the stairs which meant Robert Dudley was now single and could be an eligible bachelor or possible husband for Elizabeth. However, there was a whole scandal with the way Amy died and then with the whole scandal that tainted Robert Dudley and so then he was no longer a candidate for marriage for Elizabeth. But if you have any suggestions on who this large woman could be, Put in the comments below and let me know. On the rosy pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. In 1665, a mnemonic plague, plague known as the Great Plague, affected England. The roses referenced in this rhyme may actually refer to the malodorous rashes that one received from this. The posies were either used as a preventative measure, hoping to prevent getting the plague, or also it could have helped cover up the stench. Because I read where posies would have been put on the, on the carts that collected the dead bodies. Posies would have been put around it to maybe help mask the smell a bit. And then the very end, we all fall down. We all fall down dead. Well, 
not exactly a cheerful children's rhyme. This one, Rain, Rain, Go Away, I've actually heard a couple different versions. Here's one. Rain, rain, go to Spain. Don't come back again. Rain, rain, go away. All the children want to play. This rhyme is possibly about the Spanish Armada being defeated by the English in 1588. In the 17th century, James Howell wrote in his collection of proverbs, rain, rain, go to Spain, fair weather come again. And then later, in 1687, John Aubrey noted little children saying, rain, rain, go away, come again on Saturday. But if you think of like the first version, rain, rain, go to Spain, you can see where maybe the, with the Spanish Armada being defeated, go back to Spain, we want fair weather to come again. This is where there's hints to the political side of things without actually saying what was being alluded to. Sing a song of sixpence. Here goes the rhyme. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was open, the birds began to sing. Was not that a dainty dish to set for the king? The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen was in the parlor, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes, when down came the blackbird and pecked off her nose. Now with this rhyme, sounds like the king is probably King Henry VIII, as I've mentioned who he was before. The 24 blackbirds baked in a pie, this was actually a thing that was done in Tudor and Elizabethan England, as well as in parts of Europe. They wouldn't actually bake live birds. What they would do, they would bake the crust of a pie and think of like a pot pie. So you bake the crust and then they would remove the top layer of the crust, put all the birds in, put the top layer back on, and then serve the pie. And so when the pie was served during feast, you would cut into it and you would already hear the birds singing and chirping underneath the crust, and then they would cut into the pie. And then the birds would fly everywhere, and everyone had a good laugh. And with this rhyme, I'm thinking it, the queen is Anne Boleyn and the maid is Jane Seymour, which I'll explain more of that in a minute. The king was in his counting house. This is probably in reference to Henry VIII. He came into great wealth after the dissolution of the monasteries, which started in 1536. With the monasteries having the dissolution, then all of the gold, silver, anything they had of worth, their land, everything went into Henry VIII's coffers. All of a sudden, he's into a lot of wealth. The blackbird, it may represent the demise of those tempted by carnal pleasures. Could be. But... Where I mentioned before, with the queen being Anne Boleyn and the maid being Jane Seymour, there were also references I found where some historians believe that that might be Catherine of Aragon, the first wife of Henry VIII, as being the queen, which would make the maid Anne Boleyn. The thing is, Henry VIII started the dissolution of the monasteries about 1536, and if memory serves me correctly, Catherine of Aragon died in January of 1536, and then Anne Boleyn died in May of 1536. So between the two, I think there's a better chance with the monasteries going through the dissolution process during 1536 that there's a better chance that the queen would have been Anne Boleyn. A lot of people did not like Anne Boleyn already which would explain why like she's in the parlor eating bread and honey. She's not dealing with the public at all. She's away in her own little room eating nice food. And that would help explain why like, you know, people didn't like her. So if it's Queen Anne Boleyn, then the maid would be Jane Seymour, who would then be a rival to Anne Boleyn, which could explain why she got her nose pecked off. As far as those being tempted by the carnal pleasures, 
That was something I found in my research as a suggestion about the blackbird representing, representing that. I also saw where um, some believe that the blackbird pecking off the nose actually represented the church, which with that, if Catherine of Aragon were the queen referenced in the rhyme and Anne Boleyn is the maid, then that could make sense because Anne Boleyn with the divorce of Catherine of Aragon and the marriage of Anne Boleyn that helped bring about the Protestant Reformation in England and uh, the Catholic Church pretty much took a back seat. While the Catholic Church did not like Anne Boleyn, they supported Catherine of Aragon, who was the first wife of Henry VIII. So if the Blackbird were the church, then it would make sense that the Catholic Church would then want to peck off Anne Boleyn's nose. But again, with most of these rhymes, do your own interpretation. And here's a simple one that I'm sure we've all heard many times. Good night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Sleep tight might be in reference to a rope bed. Uh, rope beds were invented in the 16th century. And if you've not seen a rope bed, you've got ropes that go vertically and ropes that go horizontally. And if these are not extremely tight, then the mattress in the middle starts to sag, and then you're not sleeping tightly. So you want the ropes really tight so that the bed, so that the mattress lays flat. Rope beds continued to be popular into the 19th century when coil spring mattresses were invented in 1865. Bed bugs refer to the bugs that were attracted to the mattresses used on rope beds. The mattresses were usually stuffed with something like straw or down feathers, and so bugs were attracted to this. And not what you want to have at night when you're sleeping, being bitten by bed bugs. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask, post your comments below, and remember, click that subscribe button. And for those of you interested, Here's a works cited page to give you some of the information if you want to look up more information on what was discussed.